Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept, Chapter 7. Cam was growling at a basket full of pink socks and jockey shorts when the phone rang. He knew damn well the socks and underwear had been white or close to it when he dumped them in the machine. Now they were Easter egg pink. Maybe they just looked that way because they were wet. He pulled them out, stuffed them in the dryer, saw the red sock hiding among the pink and buried his taste. Philip, he vowed, was a dead man. Fuck it. He dumped them inside, slapped the dryer on, but he hoped was broiled, and went to answer the phone. He remembered, just in time, turned down a little portable TV, tucked in the counter of the count corner of the counter. It wasn't as if he was actually watching it. Certainly wasn't that he was paying any attention at all to the passion and trails of the late morning soap opera. He just switched it off for noise. Quinn, what? Hey, Cam. Took some dawn to track you down, hoss. Todd Barnett here. Cam reached into an open bag of Oreos on the counter took out a handle. How's it going, Ted? How's it going, Todd? Well, I have to tell you, it's going pretty damn good. Been spending some time anchored off the great prairie reef. Nice spot. Cam muttered over a cookie. Then <laughs> his bro shot up. That's an impossibly good woman tumbled into bed with a ridiculously handsome maid on a tiny screen across the kitchen. Maybe there was something to this daytime TV after all. It'll do. Heard you kicked ass in the med a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. Can't thought while he munched on a second cookie. Surely it had been a few years ago that he flown across the finish line in his hydrofoil. Blue water, speed, cheering crowds, money to burn. Now he's lucky if he can find enough milk in the fridge to wash down this stale Oreo. Yeah, that's what I heard too. Todd gave a rich chuckle. Well, the offer to buy that toy from you still holds, but I got another proposition coming at you. Todd Barnett always had another proposition coming at you. He was the rich son of a rich father from East Texas who used the world as his playground, and he was boat happy. He raced them, sponsored races, bought and sold them, collected wives, trophies, and his share of the purse was smooth regularly. Cam had always felt Todd's luck had run hot since conception. Since it never hurt to listen, the bedroom scene had just been displaced by a commercial featuring a giant tulip brush. <laughs> he switched off the set. I'm always ready to hear one. I'm setting up a crew for La Crap International. The one-ton cup? Cam felt his juices began to flow. He lost all interest in cookies and milk. The international race was giant in the sailing world. Five legs, he thought. The final one, an ocean race of 300 gruel miles. You got it. You know the Aussie took the cup last year, so it's been held down here in Australia. I want to whip their butts, and I've got a honey of a boat. She's fast, hoss. With the right crew, she'll bring the cup back to the U.S. of A. I need a skipper. I want the best. I want you. How soon can you get down under? Give me five minutes. <laughs> That's what he wanted to say. He could have a bag packed in one, hopped a plane, and be on his way. For many races, it was one of life's golden opportunities. He went as he opened his mouth. His gaze landed on the rocker outside the kitchen window. So he closed his eyes, listened resentfully to the hum of the pink socks drying in the utility room behind him. I have to pass, Todd. I can't get away now. Lucky here. I'm willing to give you some time to put your fares. Pun intended, he said with some snorting laugh. In order, take a couple of weeks. If you got another offer, I'll beat it. I can't do it. I've got laundry to do, a kid to raise. Damn, if he was going to humiliate himself with a piece of him. <sighs> My brothers and I are starting a business, he said on impulse. I've got a commitment here. A business? This time Todd's laugh was long and delighted. You... Don't pull my leg so hard it hurts. Now Cam's eyes narrowed. Didn't he didn't doubt Todd Barnett of East Texas would be joined by others of his friends and acquaintances in laughing at the idea of Cameron Quinn, businessman. We're building boats, he said between his teeth. Here on the eastern shore, wooden boats, custom jobs. He had it determined to play it to the hill. One of a kinds. In six months, he'll be paying me top dollar to design and build you a boat by Quinn. Since we're old friends, I'll try to squeeze you in. Boats? That interest in Todd's voice peaked up. Well, now, you know how to sell them. Guess maybe you know how to build them. There's no maybe about it. That's an interesting enterprise. But come on, Cam. You're not a businessman. You're not going to stay stuck on some pretty little bay in Maryland, eating crabs and nailing planks. You know I'll make this race worth a while. 
money, fame, and fortune in each other. After we win, you can go back and put a couple of little slopes together. He can handle it, can't promise himself. He can handle the insults, the frustration, and not being able to pack and go as he chooses. What he wouldn't do was give Barnum the satisfaction of knowing he was rough. You don't have to find another scripper. But if you want to buy a boat, give me a call. If you actually get one finished, give me a call. The sight came through the receiver. You're missing the chance of a lifetime here. You can change your mind in the next couple of hours to get in touch, but I need to nail down my crew this week. Talk to you. Cam was listening to a dial tone. Getting hurled the receiver through the window, he wanted to, considered it, then figured he'd be the one sweeping up the glass, so what would it be the point? So he hung up the phone. Was careful. Deliberation. He even took a deep breath. And if you... And if whatever he put in the washing machine had chosen that moment to spin off bounce and send the machine hopping, he would have slammed his fist in the wall. <coughs> I thought for a minute, there you were going to pull it off. He rolled his own smaller sitting at the kitchen table chuckling. Oh, God, this gab's it. Why don't you get some ice for your knuckles? <coughs> It's all right. King glanced down at them. A couple of scrapes. <laughs> the sharp pain was a good hold on reality. A lot about this, Dad. Really thought about it. I just don't believe you're here. Red chuckled. Continued to smile. Your hair, Cam. That's what matters. It was tough turning down a race like that. I'm grateful to you. I'm proud of you. Barlow said he had a honey of a boat with his money behind it. <laughs> Kid pressed his hands on the counter, stared out the window toward the crowd. I gotta win. I could win that bastard. <laughs> Captain Crow to second in the Little America's go five years ago. I took the Chicago Mark in there last year. <laughs> Air fine sailor Cam. Yeah, he curled his fingers in What the hell am I doing here? This game's up, I'm gonna get hooked on soap operas. I'll start thinking Lily and Lance, not only real people but close personal friends. I'll start obsessing that my whites aren't wide enough. I'll clip coupons and collect recipes and go to the rest of the way out of my fucking mind. <laughs> I'm surprised at you, thinking of attending a home in those terms. Ray's voice was shocked now, but this pulled me around the edge. Making a home, caring for family is important work. The most important work there is, is not my work. It seems it is now. I'm sorry for that. Cam turned back. You're going to take, have a conversation with a hallucination. You might as well look at it. For what? For what? For dying on me? Well, that was pretty inconvenient all around. <laughs> he would have laughed. Coming in the direct tone was so typical Ray Quinn. We had to get out what was nibbling at one. So people were saying, you yeah, aim for the pole. Ray smile faded. Nice turn somber. Now. They didn't believe that. No. Came a little No. I don't believe that. Life's a gift. It doesn't always fit comfortably, but it's precious. I wouldn't have hurt you or your brothers by throwing mine away. I know that. Came on. Helps to hear you say it. But I know that maybe I could have stopped things. Maybe I could have done things differently. He sighed and turned the gold wedding band around and around on his finger. But I didn't. It's up to you now. You, Ethan, and Philip. There was a race in the three of you come, came with me and Stella. A race in the three of you came together. I always believed that. Now I know it. And what about the kid? So that's the place is here. He needs you. He's in trouble right now. And he needs you to remember... What it was like to be where he is. What do you mean? He's in trouble. Ray smiled. Answer the phone. He suggested a second support ring. Then he was gone. I've got to start getting more sleep. <laughs> Can't decide it. Then yank the receiver over. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Mr. Quinn. Right. This is Cameron Quinn. Mr. Quinn, this is Abigail Moorfield, vice principal of St. Christopher's Middle School. Can't feel stomach sick to his toes. Oh. I'm afraid there's been some trouble here. I've stepped a lot in the office. Oh, I got a trouble. Seth was in a fight with another student. He's been sus he's being suspended. Mr. Quint, I'd appreciate it if you come to my office so matters can be explained to you and you can take Seth home. Great. Wonderful. That is what Sam Cam dragged hands through his hand. On my way. The school hadn't changed much, Cam noted, since he'd done time there. The first morning he passed through those heavy front doors, Stella Quinn had all but tracked him. He's nearly 18 years older now, and no more enthusiastic. The floors were faded aluminum, and the light bright from wide windows, and the smells of contraband candy and kid sweat. <laughs> Kim jammed his hands in his pockets and headed for the administration office. He knew the way. After all, he'd beaten a path of those offices countless times during his stay at St. Chris Middle. Wasn't the same old eagle-eyed secretary man in the desk in the outer room. This one was younger, perkier. Beam smiles all over. May I help you? She asked in a bouncy voice. 
I'm here to pose bail for set the lotner. She looked at that and her smile turned was I beg your pardon. Okay, McGuinn. To see the VP. Oh, you mean Mrs. Morville. Yes, she's expecting you. Second door down a little hallway there on the right. Her phone rang. She picked up. Good morning. St. St. Christopher Middle School. This is Kathy speaking. Cam decided he preferred the battle ex who had gone in the office in his day to this terminally pert newcomer. Even as he stared down, t started toward the door, his back went up, his jaw set, and his palms went damp. Some things he supposed never changed. Mrs. Moorfield was sitting behind her desk, calmly entering data into a computer. Cam thought her fingers moved efficiently, and the moment suited her. She was neat and trim, probably early fifties. Her hair was short and sleek and light brown, and her face composed and quietly attractive. Her gold wedding band caught the light of her fingers, moved over the keys. The only other jewelry she wore were simple gold shells at her ears. Across the room, Seth was slumped in a chair, staring up at the ceiling, trying to look bored. Cam amused, but coming off as sulky. Kid needed a haircut. He realized and wondered who was supposed to deal with that. He was wearing jeans, frayed to strings at the cuffs, a jersey two sizes too big, and incredibly dirty high tops. It looked perfectly normal to Cam. He looked perfectly normal to Cam. He rapped on the door, Jam. Both the vice principals sat, glanced over with two dramatically different expressions. Mrs. Moorfield smiled. Played with welcome. Seth sneered. Mr. Quinn. Yeah. Then he remembered he was supposed to be here as a reasonable guardian. Oh, we can straighten this out, Miss Moorfield. Stuck his own polite smile into place as he stepped to her desk and offered a hand. I appreciate you coming in so quickly. When we have to take regrettable disciplinary action such as this against the student, we want the parents or reasonable party to have the opportunity to understand the situation. Please, Mr. Quinn, sit down. What is the situation? Cam took his seat and found he didn't like it any more than he used to. I'm afraid Seth physically attacked another student this morning between classes. The other boy is being treated by the school nurse, and his parents have been informed. Cam lives about. So where are they? Both of Robert's parents are at work at the moment, but in any case, why? Her smile turned, small, attentive question. Why, Mr. Quinn? Why did Seth slug Robert? Miss Moore feels sad. I understand you're only recently taken over as Seth's guardian, so you may not be aware that this isn't the first time he's fought with other students. I know about it. I'm asking about this incident. Very well. She folded her arms. According to Robert, Seth demanded that Robert give him a dollar, and when Robert refused to pay him, Seth attacked him. At this point, she added, shifting her gaze to Seth, Seth is neither confirmed nor denied. School policy requires that students be suspended for three days as disciplinary in action when involved in fighting on school premises. Okay, Cam rose, but when Seth started to get up, he pointed a finger. Stay. He ordered, then crashed into the rider. You try to take this good down, said Churchill. That's what he says. You slugged him. Yeah, I slugged him. Went for the nose. He had it with a thin smile. Showed up the straw colored hair. Flopped in his eye. It hurts more. Why did it? Maybe I didn't like his fat face. With his patience, spread of Seth's jeans. Came gripped Seth by the shoulders. Seth winced and hissed in a breath. Alarm bells went off. Before Seth could evade him, Cam tugged the arm of the oversized jersey down. Nasty little bruises. Knuckle wrappers, Cam would have called them. Ran from Seth's shoulder to his own. Get Get off me! His face heated with shame. Seth squirmed, but Cam merely shifted again. Scrapes were scored high on Seth's back. Ran wrong. Hold the deal. Cam moved his grip, laying his hand on the arms of the chair. Seth stand was, You told me what went down, and don't ever think about lying to me. I don't want to talk about it. I didn't ask you what you wanted. I'm telling you to spill it, or... He said lower in his voice, so that only Seth could hear. Or you're going to let that punk get away clean. Seth opened his mouth. Closed it again. He had to set his jaw so one more. He was pissed off. We had this history test the other day and I aced it. An idiot could have gotten an ace, but he's less than an idiot and he flunked. So he kept passing me, dogged me down the hall, jabbed at me. I walked away because I'm sick of death of ISS. Oh, but what? Seth rose us. In school suspension. It's boring. I didn't want to do more time, so I walked. But he kept jabbing, calling me names. Egghead, teacher's pet, and all that shit. Didn't let it bother me. But he shoved me back against the lockers, and he said I was just a son of a whore, and everybody knew it. So addictive. <laughs> Shamed and sick and jerked the pastor. So I get a three day vacation. Big deal. Came nodding and rose. We turned around, his eyes were nearly black and black. You're not suspending this kid for defending himself against an ignorant bully, and if you try, I'll go over your head to the Board of Education. 
jock to the core, just staring up at Cam. Nobody ever stood up for him before. He's he never expected anyone to stand up to him. Mr. Quinn. Nobody calls my brother a son of a whore, Mrs. Morfield. And if you don't have a school policy against vicious name calling and harassment, you damn well should. So I'm telling you, you better take another look at this situation. And you better rethink just who gets suspended here. And you can tell little Robert's parents that if they don't want their kid crying over a bloody nose, they better teach him some manners. She took a moment for speaking. She'd been teaching and counseling children for nearly 30 years. What she saw on Seth's face at that moment was hope, stunned and weary, but hope nonetheless. It was a look she didn't. It was a look she didn't want to extinguish. Mr. Quinn, you can be certain that I will investigate this matter further. I wasn't aware that Seth had been injured. If you'd like to take him down to the nurse while I speak with Robert and others, I can take care of him. As you wish, I'll hold the suspension in abeyance until I've satisfied myself with the fact. You do that, Mrs. Mornfield, but I'm satisfied with the fact. Now, I'm taking Seth home for the rest of the day. He's had enough. I agree with you. The child hadn't looked shaken when he come into her office. She thought he looked cocky. He hadn't looked shaken when she told him to sit down and called us home. He looked belligerent. But he looked shaken now, finally, with his eyes wide stunned and his hands gripping the arms of the chair, thin, hard shield. He'd kept tight around him, a shield neither she nor any of his teachers had been able to so much as scratch, but appeared to be deeply dented. Now, she decided, they would see what they could do for him. If you will bring Seth into school in the morning, he meet with me here. We'll resolve the matter. We'll be here. Let's go, he said to Seth and headed out as he walked down the hall toward the front doors. Their footsteps echoed Holly. Came glanced down. Knew that Seth was staring at his shoes. Still gives me the creeps, he said. Seth shut up at the door. What? The way it sounds when you take that long walk to the VP's office. Seth snorted, hunched his shoulders, and kept walking. His stomach felt as if thousand butterflies had gone to war inside it. The American flag on the pole near the parking lot snapped in the wind from an all open window behind them. The pathetically off key sounds of a mid morning music class clamored. The elementary school was separated from the middle by a narrow swatch of grass and a few sad looking evergreen bushes across the small outdoor track stood the brown brick of the high school it seemed smaller now cam noted almost quaint not at all like the prison he'd once imagined it to be I remember leaning lazily against the hood of his first second hand car in the parking lot and watching girls walking through those noisy hallways from class to class and watching girls sitting in the butt numbing chairs during brain numbing classes and watching girls. The fact that his high school experience came back to him in a parade of variety of female forms made him all host in the middle. Then a bell rang surely. The noise leveled through the open windows behind him, erupted, sent the men dried up quickly. Thank God it was all he could think that chapter of his life was over. But it wasn't over for the kid, he remembered. Since he was here, he could try to help him through it. They opened opposite doors of the vet and came paused, waiting for last minute. So, do you figure you broke the asshole's nose? A glimmer of smile worked around Seth's mouth. Maybe. Good. Cam got in and slammed the door. Going for the nose is fine, but if you don't want a lot of blood messing things up, go for the belly. A good, solid, short arm punch to the gut won't leave as much evidence. Seth considered the advice. I wanted to see him bleed. Well, you make your choices in life. Pretty good day for a sale, he decided as he started it. Might as well. I guess. Seth picked up the knee of his jeans. Someone had stood up for him. Was well, all his confused mind could think. Had believed him, defended him, taken his part. His arm hurt, his shoulders ached, somehow taking his part. Thanks, he muttered. No problem. You mess with one Quinn, you mess with them all. He glanced over as he drove out of the lots, all set, staring at him. That's how it shakes down. Anyway, let's get some burgers or something to take on the boat. Yeah, I could eat. Seth swept the hand under his arm. Got a dollar? When Cam laughed and punched the accelerator, it was one of the best moments of Seth's life. The wind was out of the southwest and steady so that the marsh grasses waved lazily. The sky was clear and cheerfully blue, the perfect frame for the heron that rose up out of the waving grass over the glittering water, then down like a flashing white kite to catch an early lunch. On impulse, Cam had tossed some fishing gear in the boat. With any luck, they'd have fried fish for dinner. Seth already knew about more. Seth already knew more about sailing than Cam had expected. Shouldn't have been surprised by it, he realized. Anna had said the boy had a quick mind, and Ethan would have taught him, well, it patiently. When he saw how easily Seth handled the lines, he trusted him to trim the jib. The sails caught the wind, and Cam found speed. God, how he had missed it. The rush, the power, the control. 
the poor through him, clear his mind of worries, obligations, disappointments, even grief. Water below, his sky above, and his hands on the helm, coaxing the wind, daring it, tricking it into giving more. Behind him, Seth Green caught himself just before he yelled out in delight. He'd never gone so fast. With Ray had been slow and steady, with ease and work and wonder. But this was a wild free ride, rising and falling with the wave, shooting like a long white bullet to anywhere. The wind never took his, nearly took his cap, so he turned the bill backwards so the breeze wouldn't catch it and flip it away. They skimmed across the shoreline, past the waterfront docks that were the hub of St. Chris before they finally slowed. An old skipjack, no longer in use, was docked there, a symbol to the waterman's way of life. The men and women who harvest the bay brought their day's catch there, flounder and sea trout and rockfish. At this time of year in was the date. Came to man as he glanced over his shoulder. Like the 31st, Seth shoved up his wraparound sunglasses and stared at the dock. He was hoping for a glimpse of Grace. He wanted to wave to somebody he knew. Crab season starts tomorrow. Hot damn. Game day tomorrow, Ethan brings home bushel p- bushels of beauties. Well, he like kings. He like crabs, right? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> Can't pump on the top of a cop and goes, haven't you had crab before? No, you better prepare your mouth for a trait then, kid, because you'll have it tomorrow. Mary Karen's move, Seth reached for a soft drink himself. Nothing you cooks a treat. <laughs> it was set with a grin and received with one. I can do crab just fine. Nothing to it, boy, water, lots of spices. Then you pop those snapping bastards into the pot. Alive? It's the only way. That's sick! Kay merely shifted his stance. They aren't living for long. They aren't alive for long. Then their dinner. Out of six pack of beer. And you got a feast. Another few weeks, and we're talking soft shell blues. You plop them between a couple pieces of bread and bite them. This <laughs> time, Seth actually felt a stomach roll. Not me. Dude's Guimas. Too civilized. Shit. Sometimes on Saturday in the summer, Mom and Dad used to bring us down to the docks. We'd get some shell, soft shell crab sandwiches, a tub of peanut butter, peanut oil fries, and watch the tourists try to figure out what to eat. Laughed our asses off. The memory made him suddenly sad, and he tried to shake it off of him. Sometimes we sailed down like this, where we'd cruise down to the river and fish. Mom wasn't much on fishing, so she swam. Then she'd head to shore and sit on the bank and read. Why didn't Why didn't she just stay home? She liked to sail, came to the top, and she liked being there. Ray said she got sick. Yeah, she got sick. Came to out of breath. She had been the only woman he'd ever loved, the only woman he ever lost. The missing of her could still creep up and cut him off the knees. Come about, he were. Let's head down to the M6 and see if anything's biting. It didn't occur to either of them that they, that they, either of them that the three hours they spent on the water was the most peaceful interlude either of them experienced in weeks. And when they returned home with six fat striped bass in the cooler, they were the first time in total harmony. You know how to clean them, Cam asked. Maybe. Ray had taught him, but Seth was no fool. I caught four of the six. That ought to mean you clean them. There's the beauty of being, that's the beauty of being boss. Cam began to stop dead when he saw sheets snapping on the ancient clothesline. He hadn't seen anything hanging out on the line since his mother had gotten sick. For a moment, he was afraid he was having another hallucination, and his mouth went dry. Then the back door opened. Grace Monroe stepped out on the porch. Hi, Grace. It was the first time Cam had heard Seth's voice raised in happiness and pure boyish pleasure. Surprised him enough to make him look over sharply, then nearly dropped the color on his foot as Seth let go of his hand and dashed forward. Hey there. She had a warm voice that contrasted with cool looks. She was tall and slim, with long legs she'd once dreamed of using as a dancer. But Grace had learned to put most of her dreams aside. Her hair was boyishly short, and that was for convenience. She didn't have the time or energy to worry about style. It was dark, honey blonde that was often streaked with paler color during the sun. Her eyes were quite green, and all too often had shadows dogging them. But her smile was pure and sunny, and never failed to light up her face. Or the set the dimple just beside her mouth, winking. Pretty woman came to talk with the face of a pixie and the voice of a siren. It amazed him that men weren't throwing themselves at her feet. They all, the boy all but dead, Cam noted. Surprised when Seth just about ran into her open arms. He hugged. And was hugged. This prickly kid who didn't like to be touched. Then he flushed, sat back, and began to play with the puppy who followed Grace out on the porch. Afternoon, Cam. Grace shielded her eyes from the sun with the flat of her hand. 
Ethan came by the pub last night and said y'all could use a hand around here. You're taking over the housework. Well, I can give you three hours, two days a week, and tell she got no further for Cam dumped the color. Took the steps three at a time and grabbed her into a loud, enthusiastic kiss. Set zest, it set zest teeth on edge. See it. Even as Grace stuttered and laughed. That's nice, you managed. But you're still gonna have to pay me. Name your price. I adore you. He snatched her hands and planted more kisses there. My life for you. <laughs> I can see I'm going to be appreciated around here and needed. I've got those pink socks soaking in some diluted bleach. Might do the trick. The red sock was filled. He's responsible. I mean, what a reasonable guy. Even owns a pair of red socks. <laughs> we'll talk more about sorting laundry, checking pockets. Someone's little black book went through the last cycle. Shit, he got an arch, bro. Looked down at the boy and clear, so sorry. I guess it was mine. I made some lemonade, and I was going to put a casserole together, but it looks like you may have caught your supper. Tonight, but we should, we could do with the casserole, too. Okay, Ethan wasn't really clear about what you need or what's done, but maybe we should go over things. Darling, you can do whatever you think we need, and I'll be more than well, and we can... And it'll be more than we can ever repay. She already seen that for herself. Pink underwear. She missed that's that inch thick on one table when an unidentified substance sticking to another in the stove. God only knew who knew that last week clean. It was good to be needed, she thought. Good to know just what had to be done. Well it takes we'll take it as it goes then. I may have to bring the baby in long sometimes. Julie minds her night when I'm working at the pub, but I can't always find someone to take her otherwise. She's a good girl. I can help you watch her. Seth offered. I get home from school at 3.30. Sons when? Cam wanted to know. Seth When I don't have ISS. Aubrey loves playing with you. I've got another hour here today. She said because she was a woman constantly forced to budget time. So I'll make up the casserole and put it in the freezer. All you have to do is heat it up when you want it. I'll leave you a list of cleaning supplies you're low on. Where I can pick them up for you. Like, pick them up for us. Cam could have known her be. What a race. <laughs> she left and started back inside. Seth, you see that that pup stays out of the fish guts. He'll smell for a week otherwise. Okay, sure. I'll be finished in a few minutes. And I'll be in. He stood up and stepped off the porch so Grace couldn't hear him through the door. Manfully, he sighed up him. You're not going to start poking at her, are you? Poking at her? <laughs> he was like for a minute the sick said, For God's sake. <laughs> it's, it's the ice chest. Even the ice chest. He started around the side of the house fish cleaning table. I've known Grace half my life, and I don't poke at every woman I see. Okay, then. It was the boy's tone to make him run his tongue around his teeth as he seen set the cool down. Possessive. Propitiary and satisfied. So. So. You got your eye on her yourself, huh? Seth Cohen a little open the drawer for the fish scale. I just look out for her, that's all. She sure is pretty. Cam said, likely not the pleasure to see it. Says, ah, slash with jealousy. But as it happens, I'm poking at another woman right now, and it gets sticky if you try that with more than one at a time. This particular female is going to take a lot of convincing. End of chapter 7.